so that we'll have the the videos available by the end of the week um yes so our first presenter will be eric richards he's going to be uh presenting on as we can all see uh the uh rather a recipe for <laughs> writing here eric is as he's mentioned a german teacher over in missouri had uh <clears throat> presenter of the year at their conference back in 2021 and was a finalist for teacher of the year. Uh, also, uh, sorry. sorry about that. Um, anyhow, so yes, teacher of almost teacher of the year for 2021 finalist. Um, also, writes a number of our German stories and his own uh, German CI series. And from there, I'll let him take it away. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, again, uh, if I cut out or you end up not being able to hear me or my freeze, uh, just throw it in the chat. And when it comes back, uh, we will back up and make sure we're all still on the same page. But I just first want to thank everyone for being here tonight. It's Thursday. I know we're getting towards the end of the week. It's kind of a could be a tough time of year, but I do appreciate everyone's time uh, coming out. Uh, today, we're talking about writing, writing in the classroom, a recipe for writing uh, with Vosis. So uh, I guess I can kind of skip over the introduction. Thanks again, Dave, uh, for that. Um, I will tell you, though, before we go on, the contact information will be at the end of the presentation, and I'll go over the contact information at the end of the presentation, and you're always welcome to contact me at any time. I will tell you, though, if you do contact me, uh, and it's a couple days before I get back to you. Just understand that I am a classroom teacher. Uh, it's been, you know, just busy time of year, but I promise I will get back to you. So if you don't hear back from me in a couple of days, I promise I will get back to you, but feel free to contact me anytime. All right. So go ahead. Let's go ahead and just kind of real quickly talk about what we're going to do today as we approach writing in our classrooms. So really what we're going to do is we're going to look at how to use VOSIS stories. And, and maybe if you're new to VOSIS or you're just thinking of signing up, uh, you can also use texts or readings for this. And we're going to use them as a scaffold, as a crutch to help students write better in the classroom. Because our goal is going to be to make uh, writing in the classroom compelling, creative and engaging for students where it personalizes for them and gives them ownership of what they write. And it makes them want to share what they write, get them excited. And then we're also going to share the secret sauce of how to get more repetition of the language and structures through writing while getting all the benefits of reading. Uh, and that's kind of the secret sauce. And as this kind of unfolds, you'll see how that uh, those go together, the reading and the writing. Also, we're going to have a couple activities where I'm going to ask you to jump in the chat. Uh, just as a student, just this will be real quick, real brief, just to kind of give you that feeling and you can feel free to jump in the chat or just part uh, if you'd like to participate or just observe whatever you're comfortable with tonight and maybe share a little bit of what you did uh, as a student with the group. So again, I'm just gonna go ahead and tell our big goal that we wanna focus on as we move through uh, the presentation today. Our goal is to use VOSIS or any text to create a recipe for better personalized writing that allows students to grow confidence in their writing and language abilities and excites them to freely engage more fully in class. So that's kind of our big idea as we approach. We want students uh, writing better, improving language abilities and engaging in class. So that's gonna be our big goal. So we'll start with an aperitif or should I say an aspiratif to get us going. I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions uh, with our time frame and uh, the medium here, we're just gonna have you just think about them, okay? Just I just want you to think about these in your head. Uh, you don't need to respond. If you choose to, you throw something in the chat, that's fine. Just gonna ask a couple questions to get us going. So how many of you find that your students have difficulty and or do not enjoy writing in the target language? Just kind of think about that. And there's a reason I'm asking you these questions. And how often do your students write in class or even creatively write in class? Okay, and then I'm gonna ask you one more question. How many of you still have your students physically write things down on paper and not type it out on computer? All right, so I wanna let you guys go ahead, and marinate on that for just a second. And there's a reason I'm asking these questions. Committee for her tax the rich dress. Oh, I think we got somebody under un unmuted there. Okay, thank you. Uh, and a little background here is why well, I'm asking these questions because my students were having difficulty in class. They were not enjoying it. They were in fact bored. A lot of what we were doing was not engaging. It was very predictable and actually mechanical in many ways. So they got bored. Uh, expressing themselves proved difficult in writing and they didn't wanna share. But my goal was I wanted them participating and sharing and writing better in the classroom. So a lot of this was just born out of experimentation and in the classroom with my students. 
And I will tell you real quickly, when we get to the activities here just shortly, I do this with all of my classes and my st students really do engage. They're proud of their work and they wanna share their creativity. So I do wanna share that this is all actively done in my classroom, uh, these activities. I do want to come back to that last question here real quick, uh, real quickly, just something to keep in mind. And why do I ask about physically handwriting uh, in our digital age here? Uh, we are one to one. Our students, we do things on the computer. Obviously, we use VOSIS. We do a lot of great things. And I'm not knocking that. But this is just something to keep in mind that handwriting actually they find boosts learning and memory. Physically drawing letters activates a distinct neural pathway that improves reading comprehension and memory of language. So obviously two, uh, two goals that we wanna hit, reading comprehension and memory of language. So I do have my students physically write things out on paper in my classroom, so for that reason. Uh, and also they find that the benefits of writing with pen and paper uh, are more powerful than a keyboard because when you write, other thoughts will come to you. You can more easily make connections when you're actually physically writing. So I just want to throw that out that we do actually physically write in our class. A lot of these are built where you can physically write them in class for those benefits. And I do want one more thing about writing, okay, uh, is that we actually really do, when I thought about this with my students as approaches, we are constantly communicating through written language. I don't know you about uh, your students, but my students, phones, uh, high school, I teach high school, boom, 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 the texting, the snapping, we may only dismiss it as tweeting, posting, but they actually are communicating through writing like all the time, probably more than I ever did at that age. So although they're not formal genres of writing, they are a form of writing. And so it is a part of their life. So if we can just get that to get, do that in the target language yes. a little bit more, we'll be all right. So just kind of it's just some food for thought. And then I'm gonna, just before we get started, we're gonna start here in a second. I just trying to, to prime here a little bit. We talked about, we're gonna, drive our students back to the text and reading through writing and you're going to see us do that and why is this important because i personally this is just a, the eric richards opinion here i just i find reading so important both in their l1 and l2 so the more i can get them reading uh the happier i am and i think just very so beneficial for the students and i'm just going to read a couple of things they found about reading and why i'm always trying to drive my students to read more in class uh I'll just, I'm not going to read them all, I'll just read a few, but I'll share this one by Dr. B uh, Bill Van Patten. He says, for maximum vocabulary development, learners need to read all along the way, since most vocabulary development in both L1 and L2 is incidental, meaning that vocabulary is learned by or as a byproduct of some other intention, which is normally reading. And I really found this uh, from Jim Chalice, uh, is the visual receptors outnumber our auditory receptors. Uh, look at that, 30 to 1.32. So he's saying the chance of a word or sentence being retained in our memory bank are 30 times greater if we see it instead of just hear it. So again, I want, to, I want them to see this. I want to drive them back to the text. And uh, as if we heard before that from Dr. Stephen Krashen that many studies confirm that those who read more write better. And this last one, I think is really, it's really interesting. It says that learning is rooted in repetition in convexity, meaning that the reading of a single text twice is more profitable than reading two different things once. So I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. What well, we kind of talked about writing, where we are as a society and the benefits of reading and why we want to drive them back to our text. In just a second, we're going to jump in, but I just want you to relax, have fun. We're at the Vosa Spring concert. So just relax, enjoy yourself. And when you return to your classroom, uh, just remember that you're the expert in your classroom. You know your students and their abilities, so you can take the overall ideas here, implement them as you see fit, play to your strengths, play to your teaching style. And if you if you can improve it, let me know. I'd love it. I'd love to hear your ideas and what you're doing to make it great. So just let me know. Uh, I will tell you also, uh, uh, as we get looking here, so to say, uh, I will as I present, nothing is ever meant to overwhelm you. I want this to be a resource for you to come back to the recording to see these. So don't try everything at once. Maybe find one that resonated with you tonight. Try it out when you get a chance. Get comfortable with it. And if something else spoke to you, come back and do that. So, all right, we guys, are we ready? Are we ready to get going? Everyone feeling good? All right, all right, all right. By the way, if you see me looking this way, it's because I'm looking at my other screen, checking my chat. So I'm again, I'm not ignoring you. Okay, this is, I'm gonna have you jump right in with me here right now. All right, here in just a minute. Our first activity, okay. So we're gonna jump right in right now. These are, and again, I do these with my students. Our first one I call condensing content. So here in VOSIS or any text, 
you have a nice reading. Voses has great readings and stories. I'm a little partial to those German stories. I think they're pretty good. But uh, so you have these great stories and they're written. So I want to come back to these stories uh, throughout Voses or any text. And basically what I do is I just tell my st students, after we get done reading with the text or working however you work with the text, go back and write down five numbers of the most important uh, five or really whatever number. It could be four, three, six, whatever the length of the most important senses that retell the story, okay? Importantly, though, they're not allowed to change sentences or combine sentences. It has to be the original sentences, okay? And the reason is, is again, we're going with that neurological pathway, the neural pathways there of, of writing good language because this is good language for them, okay? So what I'm going to do, and I'm going to tell you how we can work with this for, further. I wasn't sure. I figured we had all languages here, so I just kind of Put the English one here. This is not a translation of the Spanish. I was just trying to give you an example here of Voces. If we could just take maybe a minute or so, read through this. And if anybody would like to drop this in the chat, could you write down the four most important sentences in your opinion uh, that best retell this story? If someone said, hey, what's it about? And four sentences, what would that be? And I will give you, uh, I'll let you know, there's no right or wrong answer. What four sentences would you think would best retell the story or summarize it. So I'm gonna give you 30 seconds. I, I, do I have a volunteer too? Or, cause I don't wanna just, uh, I'll keep moving if nobody wants to try it, it's all right. But I want you to do this cause I, the reason I'm gonna have you do a few of these is I want you to feel a little bit what the student is feeling and seeing what's really kind of going on behind the curtain when we're doing this in the classroom, okay? So again, if you wanna type out four sentences, that you think are the most important, original, can't combine, that'd be great. If I could have a volunteer or two, I'd really appreciate it, as many uh, can jump in there. And uh, as we're as uh, we're waiting here, um, I will tell you that this is a very, this is very quick, there's no prep, and it's very, the effective filter isn't, isn't there, it really comes down because you're not asking the students for a right or wrong answer. You're asking them, what do you think? What do you, what do you believe to be the four most important or five or whatever number you prescribe? Uh, sentences for that story. All right. Thank you. I appreciate you. I, I'm looking at the chat here. I appreciate people jumping in there. And if you look at the in, at the chat, you're going to see some, uh, as it populates, you're going to see that people have chosen different sentences. And that's exactly, that's okay. Okay. Because what is what is going on here as they're doing this? Okay. What is going on here? We're driving them right back to the text. And we're writing this out, so we're getting a little benefit. We're just kind of getting them warmed up to writing here, uh, and we're driving them back to the text. So really, that's the kind of sneaky behind the curtain. Let's go back to the text. I want them to keep rereading, rereading, see the structure, see the vocabulary here that we've already previously worked at. So, and thank you, I really appreciate it. And I, those who are doing this, I hope I hope you're feeling what I'm saying because we're going to come back and I'll give you a chance to kind of just give a share a thought or two with you. But at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and move on if that's okay. Um, I, again, I appreciate, take out the chat, uh, everyone doing that. Because that's a very simple activity you can implement whenever you like. And in fact, I implement that quite a bit in my classroom, the students like it. And, but I do try to extend it. So for example, if we took our two, our students here and they each wrote down their four or five sentences, I just tell them, turn their partners and pair sentences. Did they share any of the same sentences? Were they same? Maybe I have them just swap papers and they read it again. One more uh, repetition, or do they just have them read it out loud to their partner? Uh, so these two students, these two students, just compare. See, hey, we shared three sentences, two sentences, whatever it may be. And then what I might do to even grow it further is I say, okay, you guys, I need you guys to go back to the uh, to the uh, text here, and the two of you that came together could decide on four sentences that you both agree on that. Uh, best retell the story. And again, so what are those two going to do? We're going to drive them right back to the text. They'll decide on four. And again, you can keep actually growing this as much as you would like to uh, until you come up with a whole class, until the class is in a discussion about what are the four most important senses or whatever it is of the reading, if that makes sense. So you can just kind of just start them in two and then grow it out. So these two decide on four. They meet up with this group over here. Then they're now they're four. They could decide and so forth. Or, and if in your upper levels, uh, where their, their ability is there, you can have them talk about in the target language why they feel something is more important than others. So, but what I'm gonna tell you is that you're gonna see your students reading deeply. They're gonna, they're gonna 
read the text multiple times. And, and here's my little tip for you. I always, always make it a smaller number that's harder for them uh, because what they'll do is they'll say, I wanna write more. I need one more sentence. Can I have one more sentence? Please let me write one more. I'm like, I'm sorry. No, we only this. Uh, it's four this time. You got to decide. And what will they do? Will keep driving them back uh, to uh, to the text. So if you make it a little bit harder, they'll read a little bit more. Uh, so all right, are are we good? Is everyone good? Does that kind of make sense there? That's a great one. Really easy uh, to try out in your classrooms with all your readings. All right. Uh, now. I'm gonna give you a variation because I don't know about your, your students, but my students, if I just change the name of something, it's a brand new activity and we're pretty busy. So uh, I don't wanna reinvent the wheel all the time. I call this the exact same activity, but I call it mind reading. I just pair up students and one student writes down the number of the most important sentences that retell their story. They have a partner and their partner has to, to write down uh, what she or what she thinks, you know, her partner is and they compare and see how many they get right. And if you think about it, it's the exact same pretty much uh, activity as before, but you just kind of gave it a little spin and had them work with a partner, say, try to meet, read my mind. And the next time you do it, have them have the same partner reverse roles and see so it kind of just turns into a guessing game. It gives it a different feel, and then they can compare sentences how they how they do. If you uh, if you want to get involved, this is a lot of fun. If you do this when you're done working with your text and you've and they're familiar with this, I just say, hey, I have my five sentences class. I need we're going to see which student's going to read my mind the best and who can who can guess the most numbers of sentences that I. So I have my sentences. Then the class writes down theirs and we reveal our sentences to each other. And of course, we're working in German, our target language. And the student that got, let's say, you know, they had five and I had five of the students that got five all get a sticker or something very little. So my students are very, very excited for stickers. It's it's amazing. So I go with it. I definitely go with it. But it's a good way to get involved and just take really the same activity activity and make it very similar for your students and for you. So. And it's really low prep. It's a lot of fun. You're going to get lots of reps with it. And it's going to be a lot. So, all right. Uh, we're ready. If we're ready, if we're ready, if we feel good with that one, give that one a shot. That's an easy one. We're going to go down to something I call the treasure hunt with my students. Okay. And again, we're, we are doing writing. So they're writing this stuff down and we're going to get to different activities where it's a little bit more open as we go. But these are first really great. These first couple are really good for supporting your students. And just getting them used to writing in class, it's very low stress for your students. So this kind of gets them going. Call it treasure hunt. So again, we have our text from Vosis or wherever, and, and you've read it and you've worked with it in your class and they're familiar with it. But I want to drive them back to the text and start forming that neural pathway for them. So maybe I just say, hey, go back to the text class. Can you write down three sentences that contain the word? room or rooms or sentences that contain the structure. Maybe we were looking at work like share a room was a structure we were working on or or maybe you can even do it with topics because you write down three sentences that, that deal or talk about family. And again, they would find that throughout the text and we're going to drive them back and have them start uh, uh, writing that down on a paper and then sharing and, and, and comparing because in some texts there's going to be more than three and they're going to share and see what they found with their students. So, all right, we're going to try this one more time because, again, with our participants, I, again, we're just going to go really quickly. I'm just going to divide it. If you want to get involved this in the treasure hunt, you can put like treasure hunt one or two or three or whatever. I'm going to give you a text here. OK, again, I just put it in English because of, uh, of our, our audience here. I wasn't sure. So uh, just going to if you want to participate in the chat, can you read this and write down three sentences from a text that contain the word rooms? Just put treasure hunt one and then your three sentences or treasure hunt two. Uh, you can write it probably should say three sentences or two. It's OK. Uh, write down two sentences from uh, the text that contain the structure does not want. It's a good structure. Maybe you want to drive the students back to find that. And, or, or if you want to do treasure hunt three, write down three sentences that talk about the topic of family. So if you want to participate can you find three sentences that either deal with that have the word room or rooms in it. Uh, does not want or the topic of family. And uh, I'll just give you guys a minute here. And with your class, when I do this in class, would I do all three of those in class? Not necessarily, it just depends on time limits. Sometimes we can work with one or two of them. You know, if we're just kind of saying, hey, we worked with it, we got a few minutes left, a little quick exit ticket. Hey, before you leave on your slip of paper, can you guys go ahead and 
and write down three sentences that talk about the topic of family or have words related to family in there. Boom, on your way out the door, see ya. Or if we want to work a little bit more with it, we have a little bit more time. Uh, we can do one, two, or adjust it how we need to. So, and if, if I have done it as a, as a bell ringer that we've worked with this text the day before and when they come back in, uh, they have their text and I just have them warm up with this, take five minutes and go back to kind of refresh our text and go from there. Does that, all right, treasure hunt too, thank you. I see that, yeah, all right. And look, it looks like you're finding the sentences. Yeah, that's great. But again, as you are doing this, I want you just to kind of think because you have the teacher, the teacher mind, what's going on behind that curtain? What are you doing with this text? Yes, you're writing this down. We're getting the good, uh, the good language and good formation and neural pathways, but what's really going on? So, all right. And I'm just going to give you guys just about like 10 more, 15 more seconds here, and then we'll move on. I'm not trying to rush anybody just with the time constraints. I just want to kind of pop in here with a few, let you kind of see what's going on with us. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and go on. I'm just looking here, and I do appreciate uh, people jumping in on that chat and putting your three sentences down or two sentences. That's great. So, but again, I hope you see what's going on again, okay? All right. So let's go back. Like I said, we'll start opening this up. Instead of, you know, just, just rehashing what's on the paper, we're going to start trying to open up with some activities because uh, I teach all levels. Uh, and I want to make sure my activities and tasks with my students are level appropriate. I don't want to put them in a position where they cannot do it because they will shut down immediately. So uh, we'll start trying to open it up because I do various activities and tasks with students to obviously at their abilities, their levels. So, all right. So for example, what happens if we took our text here? We have our text. Okay. This one's in German. All right. It's about a rock star and, and he has old clothes and he needs new clothes to become a star. And then he wins the equivalent of Germany's, you know, uh, you know what, do I, how do we call that in America? Uh, America's got talent or or whatnot. Uh, so with that being said, so what we take this text here, okay, then I might say, especially with my beginners, I might say, hey, we're going to rewrite part of this text. Now, I'm going to say with all of them, keep this within their abilities. You don't want them rewriting pages of stuff, maybe a paragraph or just a section, all right, that you want them to kind of go back to. Uh, and I say, all right, let's 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 change a detail. Let's change a G, D, uh, detail with this. It could be a name. It could be a place, an action, or such. And I'm going to show you an example as we go. So for example, we have this little story here, all right? And I bolded what I'm going to change for you because here's the story. Again, I wrote this, uh, the duck at Ducks in St. Louis, sad. Uh, the duck is sad because she wants to dance, but she can't. And um, she can't dance because she doesn't have dance shoes. The duck wants dance shoes so she can dance. She, so she wants to do the duck dance. So she goes to a shoe store. The shoe store is called Shoe for You. All right, I'll leave it there. Uh, so I would say maybe if we were working with this text, uh, and yes, I wrote that just so I could write shoe for you. Uh, the, the uh, I'd say, hey, we're going back to this section, but hey guys, instead of it being a duck today, let's let's change it. It's, we're just not gonna work with a duck. So what a student might do, if we look here is say, hey, all right, take out the word duck. I want you to put in an animal that you, you think would be fun. And we're just gonna change the animal right now, class, all right? So there is an elephant. And every time we came across duck, I just had them personalize with whatever animal they really wanted to put in there. And so you're also starting to work on a little personalization because when they start putting their in their own details, it means a lot more to them. And they're gonna get a little bit more engaged for you. And they'll wanna share a little bit more. Okay, so you can kind of see how I just changed. Your duck was, I changed it right into elephant. And again, driving them back to the text. Now we're writing this out, we're writing this out and they're, they're personalizing a little bit, but there's tons of details. You can really change any detail you want. Just tell them to be consistent. You can change places, you can change verbs or actions. Maybe she didn't want to dance. Maybe she wanted to, I don't know, jump. Uh, emotions, objects, names. You can really change anything you want as long as the students keep it consistent. Uh, if you do this for the first time, I'd say maybe like change like the animal or in this case or something simple, okay? Uh, until they're used to it before you get into verbs and such. So with that, also, 
I always have my students try to like just share with each other. I always want them sharing. So when they ever create something and they're putting in their own personalization with it, have them share. They're sharing with the class. They're sharing with partners. They're reading it loud, loud. They're trading papers. So they're kind of getting that extra rep in there, reading again. And they actually, and they love it. They're always excited to share their own. And sometimes here's a fun one too. I'll share the listening one with you. So I'll have the text in front of them. Let's take Rockstar here. And I start reading it aloud in German and they're following along in the class. And what I'll do is whether we're doing a choral response class, you know, uh, how we're working with it, one of them really simple is to say, hey, I want you to signal to me as I read aloud to you, if you hear a detail that's not different than what's in the text. So for example, if we said Jonas lives in Berlin, he wants to become a rock star. He seems very, very good, but he doesn't look like a rock star. He wears uh, old clothes. He has an old blue uh, shirt on. So they would know that. So here in this case, Kraus would be gray. But if I said blue, they would signal to be like, oh, that's not right because they're following along. And I'm just changing a detail to kind of work it up. I know that's not writing, but it, it can be fun. It will really tune. They'll really follow along and read because they want to listen to see what is it that I'm changing as we read aloud. And they'll signal to me or we'll do a oral exchange. So that was a little bit of fun. Just I really have a good time. That's a lot of fun with the students. And they're not writing. You can actually read a little bit more out loud. And I think reading out loud is very important uh with my class so all right are we good so far is, is is everyone okay so far all right if we're good so far again i the point is never to overwhelm me i just want to make it this resource for you to come back and try it but then i want you to tell me how it goes because i would love to hear it i'm serious all right so if i we don't have to do this but if we want to take 30 seconds here this is that first uh the duck part right here where it says volunteers if there's something bolded would anyone, you can quickly unmute, you just read it out loud. We're not going to write this in the chat and just change it. How would it sound? Because if changing a detail changes the story, and you're going to see that here in just a second. Does anyone want to give that a shot? If you do, unmute. If not, I'm okay. Yep. You can definitely unmute. I won't it's, stop. It's really it. okay. So. All right. Okay. So if I said there's a duck, we'll keep duck the same. But let's change something else. The duck. Oh, do I have a volunteer? All right. The duck is in Kansas City. The duck is what could the duck be? Someone help me out. It's not. Maybe it's not sad the duck's today. Maybe. Terrified. 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 Love it. Thank you. Terrified. All right. Now we got a whole new feeling. But then you kind of think, okay, why is the duck terrified? The duck is terrified because she wants to give us go speech. out on the evening <laughs> go out for the evening exactly so now here we go we're going to personalize it we're going to give it a whole new feel and the kids will have a lot thanks for jumping in i appreciate it uh and when i said the details really make a huge difference with your students they really do all right because i call this adjectives all right and this this is i get so much mileage out of this and this is a wonderful one i find uh, for my any German students or people familiar with German, this is a great activity for adjective endings. Or in my case, as I attempt to learn Spanish, which, uh, well, it's going, it's going, you know, uh, I, I find this adjective keeps coming after the noun. And I'm like, well, then I have to do like row hosts and add S's and O's and A's and A and S's, but I'm getting it. But uh, it's great because then for adjective placement, uh, for your students or adjective endings or just working with adjective. And I'm gonna stop saying this here after this, but whatever you have your students do, have them trade with each other, have them trade with a group, read their versions out loud, share to the class, let them see and hear the differences. Uh, the students do like seeing it, they like hearing it, and they get tons of input in the language. So let's go back to adjectives. So we have our, our reading and I say, okay, class, let's go ahead. We're gonna take this, you know, the small paragraph for this section here. And we need to add adjectives to the story. Let's just add adjectives. So they have their paper. And here's an example. They they start writing. And they're writing. And so the original one here is I'll use our sample one. It is a fall day. There is a house. It sits next to a country road. In the fireplace, a fire glows. Smoke curls rise from the brick chimney. So I'd say, okay, could you guys go ahead? You guys are pretty good at this. Could you just add an adjective to each sentence or where you can? And so they start writing. It's a fall day, but here's an example of something they could do. It's a cool fall day. So they're writing in cool. There's a cozy house. It sits next to a quiet country road. In the fireplace, a warm fire glows, soft smoke 
pearls rise from the brick chimney. You can see how that automatically gave that original text a whole new feel. And conversely, I'm going to con let's let's compare. If I were to add these different adjectives and let it, so you can get that feeling. It's a windy fall day. There's a neglected house. It sits next to a dusty country road. In the fireplace, a small fire glows. Smoke curls rise from the black brick chimney. You see, if you can. Compare and contrast that, we really just took our original sample text. We just threw in some adjectives. We described it. And you're going to come up with a ton of different feelings for it. But I hope you can see that, how just adding that adjective can completely change. And again, they're writing this out. And, you know, and, and maybe the adjective endings or adjective placement, you know, for students. And they really like it. And what's really you'll see is it just immediately becomes theirs. As soon as they write this down, this is this is what they wrote. This is their story all of a sudden, and they'll want to share it with you. So, okay. All right. Are we good so far? That's a fun one. That's a really easy one uh, it, it, to implement. When I say easy, it's very just low prep for us. Uh, we were using what we already have in VOSIS or our text, and we're just saying, hey, let's add it in there. Are we good so far? All right. Let's digest TFIT uh, before we move on. I'm sorry, the, the, the recipe and the food puns. It's pretty bad. All right, now that I'm looking at it, like, oh, that's pretty bad. All right, uh, if we want to take, I mean, just just a minute here uh, as I look at the time, it, whether you jumped in or you're just observing, that's fine. Did any, what did you notice about these exercises? Do you want to share maybe something that was going through their head or what they're feeling or like the behind the curtain, and anything like that? Does it, it? You can just unmute here and, and jump in if you'd like, or if there's anything else you'd like to share, thoughts, feelings, just just feel free to unmute. We'll take a minute here and just kind of see if what what's your thoughts. Um, I really like the repetition. Sorry. It gives the students to, you know, to rewrite it, to share it with a partner, to listen to it again. Um, and it's, it, it really is so easy to do. Mm -hmm. um, I'm doing it tomorrow. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, no, let me know how it goes. So for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it, you, you are, as I'm seeing in the, in, it's, it's, it's repetition, vocabulary. Uh, I like I how you can do it for lower level students. I think a lot of this is because some of the students, are, you know, we all have mixed level classes and sometimes there's some kids who are like super um, struggling. And I feel like that some of these exercises they could um, be successful with. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That was perfect. Right. Because you do want to go give them that scaff, that crutch, that just the, the scaffolding to, to help them. You're right for the, for the different levels where they're at. And these were very easy and it's not demanding a lot. The effect of filter is down. And they're going to engage with you because you're not just like, OK, go write 10 sentences about whatever, you know. So and, and there's a place for that. And we're going to see that. But you, know, you want to always keep yourself with inbounds. What is their abilities? When I say inbounds, what's their ability? Because if, if we start going out of bounds, they start shutting down. So what, what are their what are their abilities? What can they do? So. All right. Does anyone else want to chime in or, or we'll or we'll move on? OK, then I will go ahead and we'll keep going. We got a few more ingredients here for you tonight, uh, as I like to call them, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, this is a lot of fun. Okay, I call it rotating desks. So what I do is you can take structures from a story or a text that you just used, or you can actually even make your own up using store, uh, structures uh, and vocabulary that you there and build upon that. So basically, this is what I do. Okay, is if if you have desks in your class or whatever the writing surfaces are, they put a piece of paper on their desks and I project a slide, okay? And this helps our kinesthetic learners get up. So for example, I'm gonna go ahead and there is a blank scientist. Now this, this could have came from a story we just worked with and I'm taking out a detail and they get to fill it in. Uh, kind of like we talked about, or maybe things like there is a is a structure we're working on. Uh, and so I want to give them and I just made the slide up. So what would happen is they're sitting at their desks, their papers right there, and they write the sentence filling in the blank. There is a, a scientist. Then I ask my students to leave the paper on the desk and rotate desks, leave the paper. So they so they leave their paper, they all wrote that sentence, they then they rotate to the next desk. I project the next slide. Her name is, okay, and then they get to add a name. So they went to that desk, they read the first line, and then they write the second one, the second slide. I asked them to leave the paper, get up, move to the next desk. 
land she lives in. They write that down. But I want to ask, you see what's going on here? What do they have to do every time they sit at a new desk? That's why I ask them to leave the paper. What do they have to do? Yeah, they have to start from the top. They have to catch up with the details many times so they can keep the story flowing, so they can keep the name correct. And they have to keep reading those sentences. And now, you're right, she lives in, because I'm projecting it in the, in the target language, is, is that's that's good. They're writing that, that neural pathway right there because it's good language, and they're just filling in a detail. And we'd move, and then we'd rotate. Can you say she adds some characteristics? She is nice and intelligent, or whatever it may be. Leave the paper, rotate. Okay, she likes two things she likes. I don't know, she likes... Uh, Frosted flakes, and she likes dogs. I don't know. I'm just, and so forth. And then we would move each slide. They're moving to a new seat, but the paper stays. So and she has a dog. So, uh, so this one, when I say rotating desk, is great because, like we said, the sneaky part is, is they have to start the story over in the reading. So they're seeing the repetitions some good structures with my students. And they're filling the details. So I'm personalizing because now they're interested. And what they do is they love it because now they're working with their partners or like I shouldn't say working with, but they're reading every, what everyone else is doing. And they kind of get excited and maybe try to outdo each other. So uh, I will tell you, and then at the last slide, how many of your slides you can make it as long as you want, you know, uh, 10, 15, 20, whatever. I wouldn't really go too far over 20. It gets pretty long. But uh, the last slide, they go back to their desk and what's waiting for them at their desks, the story. So when they go back to their desk, they haven't seen their paper yet. And they're gonna start right at the top and they're gonna read the story. And now they have a whole story sitting on their desk courtesy of their classmates. And what's it's and I will give you one hint. You either, if you have a big class, just make sure you do less slides than you do number of students so they don't get back to their seat. But if it's a small class, have them skip their seat if it rotates and you're not done yet because you don't want them reading the entire story until it's over, if that makes sense, right? I'm seeing some things as the movement breaks. This is great, this, this really helps, uh, helps them. So now you got the story on a piece of paper and all you did was click the button and slide. And now they're swapping stories with each other. They'll wanna read each other's. If they're getting reading time because they're gonna wanna share, I'm drinking a cup of coffee going, all right, all right, we're gonna make it to Friday this week. And then, you know, maybe we're doing read alouds, we're sharing with partners in the class. And I've even done where they, they get really excited is I pick a story or I let the class choose a story. And now I just tell an oral story. We act it out. We bait, we just get up there and, and uh, we act out a story and we do a uh, oral story with it. And um, yeah. and sometimes I just save them. And then I have a pre-made story for your next oral story and they love it because it's theirs. And they're like, oh, I think that was mine. And so they get excited. Uh, and by the way, inevitably, if you want to throw in a little bit more for them, uh, depending on their level, have them add their personalization to the story. Detail senses, because so inevitably, uh, someone's like, oh, the story sucks. And I'm like, if you don't like it, spruce it up. Add some where you want to, whether details or sentences, dialogue. You can always set parameters and have them add more if you'd like. But I will give you one more quint here with this. This is great, because now you have an instant class storybook. I've done it where I don't do this every time. This depends where we're at in the year and how much time we have to work with. Uh, I have them take their story. We type it out much easier now that we're one to one. We double check spelling, just make sure it's good. And I have them send it to me. And I print each of the stories out. So if you have a class 20, 25, 25 stories. Uh, and after uh, I stay, I, then I just staple them together and I add it to my classroom library. And then at FER or SSR, they, they go ahead and check it out and they'll want to read it. Uh, and also what I will give you one tip though, after you print them out, give it back to the student and just have them quickly draw and illustrate it before you staple it together. Gives it more of that book feeling, a little bit of illustration and let your artistic students show off a little bit. So, but that's a great activity. Just ah, so much mileage, so many things you can do with that. So, all right. How are we doing on time? Okay. we got about 10 minutes here. So let me, uh, go ahead and do what I call publishing problems. This is going to open up for a little bit more of your upper levels or students with a little bit more ability, okay? Because really what they're going to do is they're going to take, you know, your text or your story, and then you're going to sign a parameter and you're going to have them insert things. It's kind of like adjectives, but we're going to open it up a little bit more and start maybe inserting topics. Uh, you know, maybe say, hey, add five sentences talking about travel or family and so forth. Or 
you like adjectives, they could be open, but maybe I'm actually going to try to target a little bit more and give them more structures and vocabularies that they have to assert into the stories as they rewrite it there. But it has to make sense. The, the point of this here is it has to make sense. So they're going to take the original story. They're going to start adding to it. And again, this is probably for a little bit more ability because you're going to be rewriting a little bit more sentences or, or, or structures in there. And they are going to, but it has to make sense. And what that tells me is if they can do that, what that tells you then is they actually, they really understand the reading because they really have to understand the reading to be able to do this. So it's showing you, yes, they got the reading comprehension and now they're going to go ahead and personalize it a little bit. So uh, with my, and I, you can, this is so flexible. You can do whatever, whether you want it to be structures and vocabulary uh, or with my upper level, sometimes they're used to, we've done a lot of writing in class. So I just say, hey, 10 sentences throughout different parts of the text or say, hey, uh, just go for it, make it flow. Uh, extend it, increase it, and they enjoy it. And so, uh, but again, with beginners, it can be, but you just really got to be careful with your ability so you're not out of bounds. So, or I'll just tell them another fun one or two is just have your students add dialogue or, you know, monologue what the students may say. So, what are they thinking? What are they doing? So, that's really a flexible one that you can come back to. Again, just take your text, have them insert a topic or vocabulary structures or free write a little bit for your upper levels. But again, the important part is that it does flow. It still makes sense because that's showing you they understood the reading. All right. So for example, let me give you a quick example here. Uh, if our example here is there is a monster, the monster lives in Hannibal. It's up, the monster's sad. The monster's sad, having a bad hair day. And you can read the rest. But if I said, okay, class, what I need you to do, again, I'm probably working with, with students with a little bit more ability or upper levels here is like, I want you to insert a when or a time expression. So we take our original text here and we say there is a monster. The monster lives in Hannibal now. Monster gets up before sunrise. Today, the monster is sad. The monster is sad today because he is currently having a bad hair day. He looks in the mirror and immediately puts on hair gel. He looks into the mirror again and now he thinks previously my hair was messy, but right now the gel makes it look glamorous. So again, so if I were to say, hey, with my classes, take your original text, but hey, let's throw in some time expressions or when. And you can do that. It doesn't have to be time. It can be where and location. So for example, here, you know, there's park, kids play in the park. There's a woods next to the park. I could say there's a park in Lansing. Kids play on the playground in the park. The woods are directly next to the park. A small troll lives under a log and so forth. And you can read the rest there. But again, so maybe I just take a text, say, hey, Let's start inserting this and uh, put in some where locations or when or some kind of element that you want them to focus on a little bit more while working with the original text. So uh, it's good for, you know, maybe you say, you know, like, you know, I have prepositions above, under, next to, besides, uh, you know, in, whatever, between, whatever, the, you know, some words that you could target. You could target very well in this. So it's something to think about. Almost done. So you guys, everyone hang in there. I got about six minutes. I call this one, please don't say vocab lists. Well, we have great vocab lists, uh, our target words and structures and voces. So uh, we, I tell students, again, this is gonna be for the upper levels, write an original story based on the list of words and phrases. They must incorporate all the words and phrases on the list into an original story. And I say, be sure to stay in balance because this is really something you're gonna target more with your upper classes that are, uh, that are able to do this, my, my level ones know. So for example, you, we have our lists here. All right, I need you to write a story incorporating these words. So, all right, they do it. And if we need more time, oh man, my German four classes, we have done this and they come up with just amazing, amazing stories. It's so much fun. But a variation of that would be to, if we want to bring it down a level, instead of saying, here, here's your list, incorporate them in write, bring it down a level. So I pull the vocabulary from the text or I use what here is in Vosis and I just list it. Bikes, the, the, the words are bike, kids, playground, flowers. And then they can tell me what do they think this is about. Now, so we're not writing a new story. They can paraphrase. It could be bullet points. It could be sentences. But if we, we saw these words, how are, what would what, what this story about? Kids playing on a playground at a park, kids riding their bikes to a playground and they have flowers in their hair. It, it is a Dutch tulip salesperson riding their bike with flowers in the basket past the playground and they want to buy flowers for their mom. I mean, this could... But if you just have, so what is this group of words? What, what do you think this could be about, if that makes sense? All right. 
So I'm going to share one more with you, and then we're going to be out of time here. I call it one thing at a time, okay? And I do apologize. I'm going a little quick here at the end. I just want to make sure that you can something to come back to and check out. I call this one thing at a time because I'm always looking for the leveling of my students. Where are my students? Where's the leveling? Uh, and what are they able to do? So in BOSIS, you'd see pictures, correct? Like they always share pictures with us, which is great to help with comprehension of the story. So what happens if we didn't show them the story and we just show them the picture, okay? Maybe like, for example, here in the upper right-hand corner. And I wanna level this. So maybe for my students, instead of just saying, write what you think it's about and, and write. You no, know, I'm gonna walk them into it. So for example, look at the pictures. I need you to write down five verbs that are associated with the pictures. What would be verbs that you see with this picture? Texting, talking, sitting, standing, uh, whatever, ringing, something, anything like that. But I may say, hey, write down only five words, not verbs, that are associated with the pictures. Okay, they might see like cell phone, desk, school, uh, you know, mom, glasses, whatever, whatever it may be. And then what I'll tell my students is I say this is one sentence at a time. So maybe after, and I've broken this up over the course of a week is just kind of warm up short writing activities. One day we do verbs and words. And the next day I say, hey, we're coming back to this. And they write one sentence per picture. I want you to look at the picture and one sentence per picture. And that's one day. And then the next day we come back and I'll say, hey, can you add another sentence per picture? And, and depending and say, make it flow or not. And then on the next day, maybe we say, hey, can you add one more? Or at the end of the week, a lot of times I'll say, we'll have our two or three sentences per picture that we're using here. And I'll just say, hey, on our last day, can you go back to the original sentences? Don't write anything new, but extend the sentence by adding maybe a time element, a manner element, a place. For example, he plays tennis. Maybe that was something they wrote for their sentence. And at the end of the week, they have their sentences and say, let's go extend some sentences. He plays tennis at a time phrase on Monday. At a, uh, a place, he plays tennis on Monday in the park. So they're really just, if you see what we're doing, we're just getting some words like the verbs and words associated vocabulary. And then we just write one sentence. The next day, maybe one or two more. And then one day we just try to extend what we already wrote. It's very, very non-intimidating for students that do very well at this. Uh, or again, with pictures, uh, if they have people in it, have, just have them describe people. It doesn't have to be about the story. Just describe each person, their names. Make have them it, it, introduce somebody, their names, ages, where they're from, what they're wearing, whatever you want. You can do that too. But what's neat is though, if you do this, then go back and show them the Vosa story or the original story and compare. Because really, what's going to happen is a lot of the verbs and, and vocabulary they chose and structures they chose automatically are going to be in that story because of the picture. So then they kind of get to see compare what they what they wrote to. Uh, the original story, which will probably share quite a bit of structures. So, all right, before we go, I got one minute. Does anyone want to jump in and say, what are what are some verbs we want to associate with this? Any verbs? Anyone want to jump in? If not, that's okay. I don't want to run into Gary's time because Gary's awesome and I want you guys to definitely see Gary. So, does anyone want to jump in on mute? Say, you know, what would be some verbs associated with these pictures that we see? Anyone? All right, yeah. Play, eat, Good. call, relax. Call. Yeah, just jump in there. You're perfect. Win. Yeah, you win. I mean, look at that. And then vocabulary. Champion. You want to jump in, which is <laughs> champion. Yeah, maybe tennis racket. I don't know. Maybe not super high frequency, but I have lots of kids that play tennis. So, okay. I will stop you there. I appreciate you jumping in. I don't mean to rush it or cut anyone off, uh, but I just wanted to give you an idea of how we do that. So, I will end it here. The time to simmer and come together in your brains. Like I said, use it as a resource. Pick one, try it out. Works out. Come back, try another. But definitely let me know how it goes. And I really do hope you found value today. That you're taking away something that you can readily use in your classrooms. I hope you enjoyed yourself. I love sharing this. I love working with people, hearing what they do. Because you guys are going to take this. You're going to make it better. You're going to make it fit for your classrooms. And then you're going to write me and tell me how to make it better and what you're doing. So I can do it. And we're all going to just get be better teachers. It's going to be great. Uh, again, just do one thing at a time, what you're comfortable with. You don't have to like everything. And always play to your strengths. Just because I do something or I'm a certain way in a class, just be yourself. Your students see through that real quick if you're not. So be you. They, your students know you, and you're going to do great. Uh, here is the contact information. If you shoot me any questions, um, you can, like I said, email, whatever. Uh, you can see that, uh, ericrichards.com or contact at eric-richards.com. Uh, not super active on Twitter, really, to be honest, but you can always contact me there. I do check it to see if anyone's contacted me there. So, all right. I think I did 
David, did I do it? Did I make it? Good. I did. I did. Um, All right. It's true. Do you have a link to the presentation? uh, Yes. I shared that with Aaron. And Aaron, Ah, or do you, here, actually, I can, uh, let me see if I can just share it here. Oh, excellent. Okay. You do not need this uh, program to, uh, you don't need Sway. It will open up regardless. You don't need it. So don't think that it's some program that you have to have because I created it on Sway. Oh. So Excellent. I, 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 I guess uh, with that, um, if any, if David, I'm gonna leave it up to you. If any other questions, I, I'm glad. If not, I'd like I said, definitely stay around for Gary. I love Gary. He's awesome. So and I'm looking, that really looking is. forward to seeing Gary. I'm looking so forward to seeing Gary in Savannah. I hope to see some of you in Savannah this summer at the uh, Devosis conference. It's going to be awesome. going to be there all week. It's going to be fun. Glad we can't wait to get back a little face to face and see people again. So thanks for joining yeah. us. Uh, we are good. I know that we've got a little bit of time in between before Gary starts. You want to, uh, pick up from here, Lorena? (laughs) Okay. Oh, there we go. I do. I want to share the, thank you, uh, David. I'm going to share the link for those looking for, uh, registering to our CI summit. Um, we have the link to our website give me one second i'm gonna find it i had it and i don't find it now (laughs) one second um so if you guys want to meet eric sorry grab that for you in person you know you might want to join us at the ci summit in savannah you'll get plenty of strategies and teaching ideas just like uh you have now so uh, we are really invited to uh, be part of uh, the CI Summit. You can also attend virtually because we also have a virtual option for those who cannot make it to Savannah. Excellent. Um, <laughs> and Just real quick, uh, also, I'm going to stop recording. Yes. 